Hey, listeners, stay tuned. I'm going to give you a sneak preview of four upcoming episodes of Higher Education. We're going to talk to leaders in our community about how our colleges and universities are working to evolve our workforce into the future and partner with local government and nonprofit leaders to recruit new businesses in our community, as well as great DEI initiatives. We're gonna talk to the chancellor and president of Contra Costa Community College District. We're gonna talk to Tom Epstein, the president of the Board of Governors for the California Community College Association. Then we're gonna head to Solano Community College where they have a special four-year degree in life sciences and biotech, where they are working with companies from South San Francisco and San Jose to Vacaville, partnering on growing that workforce that has to evolve and also working with city officials and regional economic development organizations to recruit new companies and new jobs into the region. And then we're gonna finalize it with President Sandine of East Bay State, talking about how they are evolving with the new healthcare focused program to create needed healthcare jobs in the region. So East Bay, Alameda, Contra Costa, Solano, listen up, this is your higher education institutions. Good morning, East Bay. What is happening in Alameda, Contra Costa, and Solano counties? Learn about what's happening in our communities, an in-depth conversation, so you know what's going on. We're talking to government, economic, political, nonprofit, and business leaders here in the greater East Bay. I'm Jared Ash, the host of the Capstone Conversation. Welcome to this episode of the Capstone Conversation. Today, I am joined by two smart and empowering women who are leading education in Contra Costa County. And we are going to talk about the Contra Costa County Community College District, how it's set up, how they are working with businesses, and how they are innovating to lead people in our community to the next level in their careers. Please introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit more, and then we'll dive into more about the college. Rebecca, do you want to go first with an intro? Sure. So I'm Rebecca Barrett. I am serving on my second term as a community college board member, so I think I'm entering into year six. I, my family kind of settled into Contra Costa around the time I was in middle school. And so I'm actually a Diablo Valley College DVC alumni. I went there right after high school, did my two years to transfer then on to UCLA and kind of built my profession around education, policy, and politics. Um, in 2016, when I moved back to Contra Costa County, Shortly thereafter, there was a position on the board that opened up and it felt like the right time and the right set of situations as an alumni, like I said, who've been working in kind of the education policy space to step up and take this on. And so I've, like I said, I've been on the board for, for six years. This year I am board president, which is exciting and sometimes daunting. But we have a really, really strong board, uh, really great district staff. Actually, um, our chancellor was just made the permanent chancellor this December. So we just had a lot of kind of big, exciting things now happening now that we've made some really key hires for the college district. It is just kind of a really great moment for the college district. And Rebecca, tell us the specific ward that you represent. What cities does that encompass? So I am Ward 3, so I am Concord, Pleasant Hill, and most of Martinez and Clayton. Great. And and it's good to have somebody young, energetic, and an alumni of the college, you know, in that perspective that's that's coming to the board. Yeah. Uh, so I first ran for the board and I was 29. I was elected at 30, but ran at 29. And I'm now... 35. So, and I always like to point out the average age, most to correct me if I'm wrong, if the statistics change, but our average age of a student at the Contra Costa Community College District is actually 28. And so, 
there we go. You know, it, I think a lot of people think that the community college students are right out of high school, which was certainly my journey. There is a significant portion of, of that, but um, community colleges really serve a wide array of students in different stages and phases of life. And I, I, I will say the most rewarding piece for me, being a board member, frankly, is somewhat attached to my age because there are moments where issues come up and I feel like I kind of have this like, oh yeah, moment of that because of my age where I sit in the workforce and how much longer I have of a professional life still to go and how recently I was in the college system provides a specific perspective that can be helpful to the board. That's great. And I'm going to write that down and we're going to come back to the <laughs> age 28 and how you you cover a large array of students, because I think that will be, I bet you most people don't know that. And I would mm -hmm. challenge you, Rebecca, mm -hmm. when you go to the next statewide conference of all the board members, find out how many other people have served that are 30 when they were first elected, because mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. that is a unique stat and perspective. So Chancellor, please tell us about yourself. And I think you're a homegrown from the college too, right? I am. I am. But I know it's a tough one. So yes. So my name is Mojda Merizada. And parts of my story are actually very similar to Rebecca's. I, with, with well, maybe just some slight exceptions. So I was actually born in Iran and I immigrated to the United States when I was eight years old. I also attended Diablo Valley College. I'm incredible, incredibly proud, frankly, of, our, of my roots, having started my higher education in the community college system. Neither of my parents went to college. Frankly, my father completed the fifth grade. That was his highest level of education. Uh, so it was, it was very, very exciting to have an opportunity to obtain higher education through the community college system and beyond. So I was at Diablo Valley College for two years. I transferred on to Cal to San Francisco State University and then Cal State East Bay for my master's degree. And I think what's probably most, most interesting about my story is when I started as a student at Diablo Valley College, I also uh, started working at DVC as a student employee. Um, and frankly, I never left. So I have been working for the Contra Costa Community College District for uh, just over 36 years now in a variety of capacities, starting with a student employee, a, a classified hourly professional, permanent classified hourly. I taught at Diablo Valley College part-time and then got into management roles, both at the college and then ultimately at the district office for a period of time. I went off to Contra Costa College, one of our colleges, where I served as college president for about three and a half years, and then came to the district office in an executive vice chancellor capacity. And then ultimately the, the board, the governing board, appointed me as interim chancellor in February of 2022. And after completing their, their, their full search process, I was really lucky and thrilled um, to have been identified as the permanent chancellor for the Contra Costa Community College District. And it's just, it's amazing to have had, you know, kind of that kind of a tra trajectory. And I always tell our students who I have an opportunity to meet with and communicate with, and in some instances serve as a, as a mentor to that there's frankly kind of nothing more special uh, than the opportunities that are provided through the community college system. I was just doing some math and I think you've been at the college longer than Rebecca has been alive. alive. So it, it, it's, I'm not saying anything about your age, but I was, I, I think it's a really interesting perspective that Rebecca brings to the equation and perspective on, on that. Tell us, let's start with, how is the community college system in Contra Costa County structured? What are the different colleges? What is the chancellor's role? Educate us about that. Certainly. So we have three colleges and two of our colleges also have center. So we encompass all of Contra Costa County. And I'll start with Contra Costa College, which is located in the 
really the West County. San Pablo is the name of the city in which they reside, right next to the city of Richmond. The college has a wonderful and amazing college president. It's Dr. Kimberly Rogers, serves as president of Contra Costa College. And Contra Costa College is our, I'll call it our oldest college by just a few months over Diablo Valley College, which is located in Pleasant Hill, California, central Contra Costa County. Diablo Valley College also has another campus. So aside from our, our Pleasant Hill campus, we have a beautiful campus out in the San Ramon Valley. So South Contra Costa County is also very deeply served and supported by our San Ramon campus of Diablo Valley College. And then as we travel east, we get to our campus in Pittsburgh, Los Medanos College. And Los Medanos College also is located in the city of Pittsburgh, but also has a actually our newest location, which is in Brentwood, our Brentwood campus. And I should also mention the two fabulous presidents that we have at, e at those two colleges. So Susan Lamb serves as president for Diablo Valley College, and Dr. Pamela Ralston serves as president of, of our beautiful campus over at Los Medanos. And just because I have three daughters and I believe in empowering women, I noticed that there's a series of leadership in women here in the college. So that's great leading the way because I bet you elsewhere, it's it's not as embracing of that in those leadership roles. So that's good to hear. How So what is the chancellor's role over those colleges? Yeah, so the chancellor really provides leadership across all three colleges and works very closely with our governing board. So the governing board essentially hires the chancellor to ensure that the policies that they set are carried out across our three colleges. So as a president of our governing board, Rebecca Barrett ensures that really kind of uh, all that the governing board does and their focus is on the really uh, our students, our mission that we are, we are moving forward in ensuring that our strategic plan, our district-wide strategic plan is carried out, ensuring that the policies that the board sets are supportive really of our strategic directions and and they get re regular reports from me and frankly at our governing board meetings from college presidents about the work that they are doing in support of our mission and the policy directions that the governing board sets for us. And how is how are all the colleges in the system funded? Let's talk to people about that. Boy, that's a great question. Not well uh, is probably the best <laughs> answer that I can give you. Uh, in terms of funding across the California public education system, we receive the lowest funding uh, in terms of dollar amounts per student. So per what? Per people. Try to yeah. describe it. We we get funded on a full time equivalent student kind of ratio along with a few kind of completion related factors. It makes it complex because the vast majority of our students are not full-time students. The vast majority of our students are actually part-time students. They take, you know, one, two or three classes while they are employed full-time. Oftentimes they're taking care of yeah, young children, in some cases, elderly parents, you know, depending on kind of their backgrounds and situations. And they oftentimes come with you know, considerable financial need. And so frankly, when we talk about being funded on a full-time equivalent student basis, it's really challenging because you know, oftentimes it takes two, three, or four of our students to come to that full-time equivalent, but it doesn't matter. Every student deserves and requires our full attention and supporting them through, you know, everything from the admissions and application process, which by the way, we admit 100% of those who come to us. <laughs> we are an open door institution. And yes, I could get in. Yes, yes there is no <laughs> doubt. We, you are welcomed uh, with open arms, frankly. Um, and so every single student requires and deserves our full attention. And it's, it's, it's frankly challenging to get funded 
on a full-time equivalent student basis. To circle back to pieces of that. So, you know, we, we sit in an interesting space because community colleges originally were actually part of the K-12 system and it was thought of as K-16. But we also do sit now in the higher ed space. And so the per pupil funding, if you look at how much UC is paid per pupil, CSU is paid per pupil, and then it precipitously drops when you get to community college. But then community colleges, so the funding mechanisms, and I don't know, hopefully we have some K-12 school board members who listen in on this. So this might hit with them. Community colleges are put into what's known as the Prop 98 funding. And so that's the Prop 98 was passed to decide a certain percentage of state funding goes to K through 16, because at that time we were part of that system. And so that's really kind of a holdover remnants of that. But, you know, K-12 in Sacramento is an incredibly popular thing to fund and should be an incredibly popular thing to fund. They have a very robust advocacy arm in multiple sides. And I think sometimes, especially coming from someone who's worked in Sacramento and in education policy in Sacramento, at times, I think the community college system has suffered from a less strong advocacy arm. And so we kind of get what's left of the Prop 98 pie that's there. And then that's part of what Sacramento works with on figuring out how to fund and allocate funds to community colleges, which can be frustrating and daunting at times. And there's also bonds. So if I look at my property tax statement, there's mm -hmm. there's bonds. And and how does that part work? Oh, so, yeah, you know, so I'll take the, I, I'll, why don't I take the first crack? This could be dangerous, but yes. So community colleges are able to put bonds on the ballot, just like um, cities and K-12 districts for infrastructure needs, right? And Community, Contra Costa Community College District is celebrating its 75th anniversary this year. And I, Mojda, you're going to have to help me with the date here, but I feel like our first bond occurred roughly when I was a student. So that would have been 15 years ago. I think it was two, I think our first bond was in 2004. 2004. So just before me, I just for the record, everyone, I was 2007, 2008 <laughs> class, started class. Uh, but if our, first, if our first bond was 2004 and we're 75 years old, we went through a significant portion of time without any bonds for infrastructure needs. We currently have three bonds that we are working with, one of which is just about to close out, but that has done a significant amount of work for us in helping to seismically retrofit buildings, bring us up to modern day code, and then frankly, like really engage and grapple with what does it mean to be a modern higher educational teaching and learning facility? So, you know, again, it, community colleges are so fascinating. And I don't know if people, if you've never been on our campuses, if you've never been a student yourself, I don't know if we, if the community really appreciates all of this, right? Like, again, I think the typical thought of a community college is they, you, you take people from high school and get them their two years to move on to a CSU. But we have AA degrees in nursing and have full nursing facilities. We have a fire training program. We have a dental hygienist program. We have automotive programs. We have a partnership with Tesla. All of that requires significant infrastructure needs to make sure that the teaching and learning environment is ad adequately prepares our students for the job market that they're entering into. And so it's like, we have a little mini hospital for nursing students and you have the, the automo automotive or uh, fire training sites, right? Like are amazing spaces that you just wouldn't necessarily think is on a community college campus, but they're there and we need to build them and we need to maintain them. And if I can just add kind of the financial piece to it. So, you know, you, you we talked a little bit about how we're funded um, and it's important to note that we're actually not funded in any way, sh shape, or form that's that's adequate as it pertains to facilities and infrastructure. And actually, there are laws in place that require us to spend specific portions of our dollars and actually 50% of all funds that 
We received from the state through the apportionment process, through the Prop 98 process that Rebecca described, at least a minimum of 50% has to be spent on in-classroom instructions. So to pay for essentially our faculty um, who are teaching classes. Uh, and so, you know, when you think about that, um, and you think about all of the other expenses that institutions have. So for example, to ensure that students have someone to work through their financial aid package, students who have disabilities actually are tested at our centers and provided accommodations to ensure that they're successful in higher education. We have beautiful libraries that support the added needs of students to be educated. Those actually do not count on the right side of the 50% law. So, you know, when we say 50% has to be expended in the classroom instruction, there's all kinds of other supports and services that we have to provide before a student gets in the classroom. And frankly, while they're in the classroom to help them get the counseling support services and transitional supports that they need to move on to four-year institutions and to the workplace that come from the other 50% of the dollars that we have, which frankly leaves little to no money in order to be able to update and maintain facilities. Thus, the reason for bonds. No, that's helpful to understand because I bet most people don't even understand the process and, and where everything comes from and there's tuition and on top of everything. So let's talk about some of the things that the community college offers as a destination. You talked about nursing, you talked about fire training, you talked about the partnership with Tesla. What are other types of programs that make you unique, right? That people should be aware of at the colleges? Yeah, I think Rebecca shared with you a lot of our really exciting career, career education programs, you know, included in that are our, we have culinary programs at two of our colleges, Diablo Valley and Contra Costa College, with full-blown beautiful restaurants the public can come to for a fabulous multi-course dinner at generally like less than $10. It's a wonderful place to kind of bring friends and family and or a business lunch. Aside from that, you know, we have really a broad range of programs, over 200 programs across our three colleges. So, you know, we certainly prepare students for transfer in all kinds of fields. So as an example, at Contra Costa College, I should share with you, we have a partnership with NASA right now where we are preparing, you know, our future leaders to, to go to Mars. It's, it's quite extraordinary, really kind of the STEM related programs and majors, science, techn uh, technology, engineering, and math, majors and opportunities that we have available for our students across our system. You know, we also, you know, sometimes we don't focus on the kind of the immediate training needs that individuals have, especially those that are really um, just really looking to earn more livable wages. Um, so, for example, we have a home health care assistant program. Um, it's a it's a fairly new program. It's a it's a wonderful program that provides opportunities for individuals to support our aging population in Contra Costa County and beyond. So we're always thoughtful and looking at what the needs are of our community and designing and developing programs that will um, provide uh, really kind of livable wage and beyond opportunities for our students to obtain employment quickly and frankly, give back to our community immediately. So that's great. Talk a bit about working with the business community here to to do that. How do you work with thriving tech sector? How do you work with senior living and, and programs? How do you work with Tesla? If you could touch on that a lot. Yeah, so every one of our career education programs actually has what's called an advisory council. And the advisory councils are made up of individuals in industry that meet with us, with our faculty members, as well as deans that support those areas. 
and they very much drive the new programs that they'd like to see or modifications and updates that they'd like to see to existing programs. So when we talk about something like automotive, for example, I mean, we know that the automotive industry has changed drastically, right, over the over the last few years with, you know, electrical vehicles and hybrid and all of those kinds of vehicles that, you know, didn't, that weren't in the mar- marketplace to the same level as they are today. And so the, the automotive program, as an example, had to shift uh, completely, if I may say, in terms of the a one uh, kind of facilities and equipment within their their area, um, as well as you know the kind of instruction that they provide um, to our students. Um, and oftentimes it's those members on the advisory committee that tell us what's what's kind of up and coming and what the shifts that they're seeing in the market. And then we modify our curriculum in order to support that. And so that's kind of the the, the partnership that we talk about related to Tesla is one of those. Um, Through their automotive program, has an incredible partnership with Toyota. It's it's called the T10 partnership. And what's amazing about that is our, our partners, our community partners, our industry partners are actually not only helping kind of design what that curriculum looks like, they are employing our students that are enrolled and giving them work experience alongside the fact that they're getting kind of their educational opportunity. So it's it's really exciting. They are they are getting paid employment while they're getting trained in a field that is, you know, obviously relevant to their future. That's great. I'm a fan of the hands-on experience combined with the academic education because you have to have both to apply things in the real world. And one of the things somebody and I were just talking about was teams in in schools. You know, our kids are criticized if they're working with a team because it's called cheating. (laughs) And here we, you know, if you, if you don't know the answer, you're supposed to go to other people. You're supposed to bring in colleagues and work to solve the problem together. And so you do that outside of the classroom and you get that hands-on experience. And that just sounds so important to have that partnership you're talking about. To bring that back to a facilities conversation though. So, you know, (laughs) traditionally we built schools with the idea of a a faculty member or a teacher, because this is K-12 and higher ed, would sit in front of a classroom and lecture. And then you'd take a test and you'd write an essay. And to your point, Jared, like you work by yourself. And this is something in education policy, at least since 2010, I think we've really been grappling with of how do we need to restructure pedagogy and teaching and learning to prepare young people for the soft skill sets that are going to be needed for a more modern day economy that is based on collaboration, communication, and less about, I mean, you can go into the history of education. The history of education really is that it was built on the idea that we need to prepare people for factory work, right? And that's why we kind of have the bell schedule and, and different pieces. And this could be getting way too philosophical for maybe for some of your audience, but we are really grappling, we in the education community are really grappling with what does that mean? And functionally speaking, it does mean redesigning the specific classroom setting. We need to be redesigning teaching and learning to be more collaborative, group-based, about building stronger communication skills. And that does mean rebuilding a classroom and restructuring a classroom so that type of teaching and learning can happen effectively. Yeah, I was reading a book with one of my daughters and originally the public school concept was K to three, I think, or K to two, I forget which one, out of New York City. And it was really, Mm -hmm a babysitting concept of, Mm -hmm. yes, let's teach them how to read and do some basic skills, but it was not intended to really be a full on system what it is today. And Mm -hmm. some of those New York schools go back to that and the bell system you're talking Mm -hmm. about reminds me of that because it was really training workers for set opportunities, not for, Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. education has had trouble evolving over the the centuries. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about your students. You talk about the average student is actually 28. Mm -hmm. 
I know there's no such thing as a student, but let's talk about what is bringing some of those older students in. And then let's also talk about the path that Rebecca took, which is go to high school, go to community college, go to college. If we could sort of talk about both groups of students and where that fits into the college. I mean, so to, ju to jump, I think it is a quite traditional path for students to you graduate high school. I kind of see them in two buckets. They either immediately come to us out of some sense of peer pressure, particularly from their parents of like, well, if you're not going to go on to a four year, you should do community college. But for whatever reason, it's not the right time and they're not in the right headspace. And so they, we usually, we will see when them leave and they enter the workforce. Or you do have a set group of students right after high school who also just enter into the workforce. But particularly in today's economy in the Bay Area, you kind of hit a stage of life where you've entered the workforce, you've done it for five to six, seven years, and you've kind of reached the cap of how much you're going to make. And then you really have to make some decisions of, should I go back and, and at least and go and get an AA or go get a, a program that's specific for workforce, right? Like nursing, dental hygienist. And 28, 27, 26, 27, 28 kind of is that aha moment for a lot of young people of maybe I should go back. Maybe I should go do that. And they're in that frame of mind now. And they kind of can see more of the long-term benefits to making that personal investment in their own education. And then the piece that we really grapple with is 28 year olds come to us with 28 year old responsibilities and that's rent and child care and oftentimes living with a partner and you have financial responsibilities with that and so how do we support them with that because the expectation is a lot of the community well they're living at home with mom and dad so they don't need to worry about food they don't need to worry about rent so we have to spend a lot of time being like well actually the majority of our students do so that's uh, to mostly maybe you could fill in a little bit more, but to me, that's kind of the stage of life that 28 year old student tends to come to us from. I, I think that was really stated beautifully. And oftentimes it's because um, also kind of the, the notion of they went into the workforce without, you know, any level of higher education or not enough higher education and are make, maybe in a position where their wages aren't substantial mm -hmm. enough to mm -hmm. really kind of maintain their life. And they realize that it's important to come back and ensure that they're you know, receiving the, the benefits that come from further education, which oftentimes is better paying jobs in, you know, in industries that help them both survive and thrive. I, I do think there are a couple of things that are really important for us to share with you, Jared. One, that is that, or actually our entire community. One is that, I think if our students enroll with us full-time, we provide free tuition. So we are, frankly, the, um, how do I say this, the lowest in the universe, in a way, because normally our, our tuition is $46 a unit, which is incredibly low. But aside from that, if you enroll in 12 or more units, um, we actually provide a, a free tuition for you for up to a two-year period. So uh, frankly, um, you can come to us for, for two years, um, obtain your associate's degree or complete your first two years of higher education um, and pay nothing and move on to, you know, UCs and CSUs and beyond and have saved a considerable sum of money. So I think that's an important element really for your listeners to hear about as well. Yeah, that's, that's a good note, especially as we read headlines about student loan debt piling up generation, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know, people working 20, 30 years to pay off student loan debt. And not defining what jobs they take versus what they fall in love with. What how, What's the percentage of people who graduate and move on to a four-year degree versus move directly into the industry then? So that's a hard question to gauge because we, we do it kind of based on a cohort analysis. 
based on what students tell us they are seeking when they come in. Remember, we've got students that come who have no intention of moving on to a four-year institution. We have others that actually come to us as, and, I, and we didn't mention this, as high school students. So mm -hmm. we offer a really robust dual and concurrent high school enrollment program where, frankly, oftentimes we have students who start with us as sophomores while they're in high school taking classes with us. And by the time they finish their senior year, they've already completed their first two years of higher education. So there's kind of, there's that group that I would say is in the mix as well. And then we actually have a high school on our Contra Costa College campus. It's the Middle College High School program where students are literally in high school on our college campus, plus they're taking college classes simultaneously. So I think when um, you were hearing uh, Rebecca kind of talk about we're kind of everything to everyone, <laughs> I, I think that becomes more clear. So when you ask like what percentage, it's really hard to say because it's really dependent on kind of their reason for coming to us in the first place. So those that come to us it focused on obtaining an associate's degree and moving on, we work very adamantly to ensure they reach that goal. And kind of depending on the number of years they've stayed with us, that percentage kind of varies. And we're happy to, to give you like the more specifics on that as we as we dig it out and then get it to you. We yeah, we'll add a link in the show notes to a couple of stats for Perfect. everybody. So right now it, it goes back to that casual conversation. I want to ask about another issue that I have read about in the papers recently. There's a big problem going on with all of the colleges, not just community colleges in California with homelessness on campuses. Mm -hmm. There's Humboldt mm -hmm. University. It got into a big fight with, apparently they had like 2000 students living in their parking lots and they had created makeshift showers, but they were all helping each other and they were all full-time students, but this was the option instead of working or commuting or doing something else, they were living in cars and tents and parking lots. What kind of problem do we have here in Contra Costa? How are you working with students? Talk us through some of that. I think housing insecurity is something the college district, frankly, so like I said, I've been on the board six years. It's one of the first things we really talk about when I got on the board. Mojda, again, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's close to, if not 50% of our students, yeah, identify as housing insecure. So that definition can be somewhat broad, but the idea is 50% of students are self-identifying as they're not sure they're going to be able to make next month's rent. And that type of, like, that's the financial situation that they're in. Um, and frankly, that is not conducive to good, good learning, right? Like if you're constantly, if your constant worry is how can I pay rent, are you really worried about that English essay deadline? Like in, in the Mavlog's, hierarchy of priorities. And frankly, I think that was a big reason why community colleges saw declining enrollment during COVID because our students are on the front lines of, of the economy. And so when the economy takes a dip, they've got to prioritize making sure that they have income first to make sure that they have a roof over their head. We're, our th all three of our community colleges don't have housing. It's something that we are actively talking about as a community college board and as a community college district and what type of investment that might take. And frankly, like the state has put out options, grants to help community college districts think through what housing could look like and potentially help us build, but it's a drop in the bucket and it, it's a competitive grant process. So frankly, if we were to go about doing it, a bond would have to be a significant piece in helping us get there. And then frankly, I think this is also a place where cross-agency collaboration and communication could be going much stronger, right? So we identified, Moshe identified where our three colleges are and our two satellite colleges or our two satellite campuses are. I, I Hopefully some city council members are listening to this conversation who represent the cities of San Pablo and Pleasant Hill and Pittsburgh and Brentwood and San Ramon. 
because the city is really set a huge chunk of housing policy. And those are the cities that our colleges are in and our students will mostly reside in. And we see the trickle down effects of state housing policy and local housing policy and how it affects our students. And then also, frankly, our own employees. You know what, let's, let's set up a meeting, Rebecca, let's you and I talk and mm -hmm. maybe it's college by college or something, but let me help facilitate a meeting with those cities. Cause I, I bet that those cities don't even know that there's an issue going on. Yeah. Right? We're yeah. thinking about it. Maybe they do, yeah. maybe they don't, but better we, we actually have a facilitated meeting where we could start a dialogue towards longer term, short term and longer term solutions. Jared, you should know that we do provide some services to our students that are yeah. homeless. So for example, they we ensure that they can utilize the, our gymnasium facilities for, for bathing, for showers and what have you. Um, so that's uh, certainly open to our students and available and is communicated to our students that have a need. We also have food pantries across our three colleges where we want to ensure that our students don't go hungry. And then we have like really amazing things like career closets, which I would love Rebecca to share a little bit more on because she has been just at the forefront of helping make it happen. <laughs> Thank you. So what Moshe is referring to there is I was looking to do some type of active service for MLK Day Weekend. And so for the past two years, I've been doing a professional clothing drive that then the clothes are split between the three college campuses. Um, so we have a professional clothing closet at all three campuses now to help support students who are going out for their first internships, their job interviews, where, you know, $100 for a blazer or $150 for a suit could be a real challenge. Again, 50% of our students identify as housing insecure. So housing, success at school, are you going to be able to buy that piece of professional clothing? But we all work in the business sector. We know what type of stigmas are put on, on young people entering the profession. If they don't have the professional clothing and resources, right? Like it, it is a barrier. And so um, I'm just super proud of us for thinking of all the different types of barriers that we can help our students overcome. That's great. The next time you do a big drive, let me know. I want to help first. I, I think I just gave like five or six dress shirts to Goodwill. And oh yeah. I think it would make more sense to to give them to you, but I might also be able to spread the word, right? And and just get some of my neighbors, people who aren't thinking about what's in their closet. We'd be happy to do that. And my wife and I do a Halloween costume drive with Shelter Inc. And we help collect costumes for all of the and it's growing. So it's we're we're hoping in 2024 to tackle every kid in the county that's homeless or that even if they do have a home, but they don't have the money to afford a costume. And it's really the self-esteem issue, mm -hmm. right? If you're a kindergarten, if you're a fourth grader or eighth grader and your friends are having a costume party or you're doing a co costume parade and you can't afford it, you don't want to go to school that day or you don't feel like you fit in and it really helps boost them. I know there's groups that do prom dresses. It's a big one, but I I'd love to be involved in what you're talking about and, and doing that. And I heard you use the word and you used it in this description and you used it one other time is stigma. So there mm -hmm. are probably a community college stigma out there, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. people should just be going to the four-year college. What mm -hmm. does that mean? Mm -hmm. Let's just address that as maybe one of the closing out issues here today. What? How do you tackle that? Or what would you say about that? So I'll share my personal story there because I think I really actually had my, I had to grapple with this myself, right? So we moved here in, when I was in middle school, like Moshe, I actually lived abroad. I grew up in England and Saudi Arabia. And so when we moved back to where my father is from, the Bay Area, was really kind of when the talk of college started coming up. And I'm actually pretty severely dyslexic. So I was always an academically smart student, but not necessarily the best grades, but like I had a, I think I had a high school unweighted 3.4, 3.5 GPA. And my parents always really pushed like, 
get into a four year, we will figure out how to pay for it. Like we're very blue collar, but we, we will figure it out. And then I graduated 07, which was the beginning of the housing market crash. And what my parents wanted to do was actually borrow against the value of the house to pay for my college. And so while that was all go like, as we were all as a society dealing with that, my dad had the very first conversation with me in, in high school of, I don't think I can do this for you right now. And I do think you're going to need to go to community college. And I remember sitting in my AP English class and the teacher had asked everyone to go around and talk, say what college they were going to. And everyone say, you know, Berkeley, Davis, UCLA, uh, Boston College. And I said DVC and I kid you not, I started crying. Like I thought it was such a sign that I had messed up and like, I'm still crying now and went to DVC. And it wasn't until after I'd gone through it all, I can honestly say DVC was a better higher education learning experience for me than UCLA. And it's, it's different for everybody, but DVC was the first time in the United States that my dyslexia was properly diagnosed and, and handled in England. I was, and keep this in mind, I was diagnosed in Saudi Arabia and in England and given accommodations both times. And then when I moved to the United States, the K-12 system, literally we had a meeting where my grades were too good. We don't need to provide you any extra services. And we're not taking the tests that you received in foreign countries. Went to DVC, they immediately tested me, gave me extra support services. And I felt really supported and seen and smaller class sizes. The fact, because there's still such a focus on, we need to help you move on to the next phase, right? I very quickly identified, like, I want to transfer. So it's like, I came in and I was gunning for it, which is not every student's experience. But, you know, I had faculty members who were like, this is how we're going to get you to be a better writer. Here are the different drills we're going to do. Here's all the different books that you can read. And it was such a supportive, collaborative educational experience. And again, smaller class sizes. And then you got to UCLA and a poli-sci major. So the majority of my classes are 200 person lecture halls. And in a lot of ways, they're like, you're here, you made it. So we don't need to push you on being a better writer. You kind of are where you are and, and that's okay. But I write professionally today, right? So I would have loved the continuation and, and the challenge. And so it, it's really being able to look back now. I, I left that stigma really hurt my feelings and I, I attached myself to that stigma. And so as much as I can with talking with young people, is like, I hear you, I, I was there. I did not want to go to a community college. It was the best thing for me. And I think it would be the best thing for a lot, a lot of students. And we can't let stigma get in the way of it. it you shouldn't do something because other people expect you to do it. You should do what's best for you in for that moment. And the community college system provides, I think, one of the highest quality higher education throughout the world. And we're so lucky to have, have the Contra Costa Community College System supporting our county. I think it's really one of the crown jewels of Contra Costa County. Jared, if I can say, I think the stigma comes from the fact that we accept 100% of mm -hmm. individuals that are interested in coming to us, which is really a shame. I mean, it's a shame that that's kind of where the stigma stems from. It's not, you know, you're not special by, you know, coming here in that sense. And, and I'll tell you, I, I went to Akalani's High School, Lafayette, and talk about stigma. <laughs> So, you know, when my classmates, similar to Rebecca, were talking about going to, you know, prestigious four-year universities and beyond, and I was going to DVC, I, I, you know, I mean, honestly, like, I had a strange sense because one, my brother, when he got into DVC as an international student, and he had to get into DVC as an international student, he was jumping for joy. So I remember him jumping for joy and being so excited about getting accepted to DVC that I was like, I'm going to go to DVC. So when, you know, my classmates are like, you're going to 
DVC. It's like you go to DVC. And I'll tell you the funniest thing. So I went from high school directly to DVC. Two years later, I was off to my four year and I finished everything on time as a result. When I was working at on campus at DVC, I would see my friends who had gone directly to a four year a year later come back to DVC. I worked in the Cooperative Education and Career Development Center. So they'd come in and I'd see them and I'm like, hey, you know, so and so, I thought you went off to, you know, this university. She's like, yeah. So it was a rough experience. I'm back at DVC. So honestly, like, what an awesome institution that we have that one accepts all and ensures that you reach your potential and provides the supports and wraparound services as you just heard Rebecca describe and believes in you, ensures that our faculty are fully dedicated to you and your needs, focused only on instruction. They don't need to do research. They don't need to prove themselves. They're proven. It's, it's really special. Wow. I, I think that was a great answer. And I liked how the two of you were homegrown and were able to tell such personal stories of where she'd go. And I think just as somebody who, who lives here in the East Bay, whether you're in Alameda, Contra Costa, Solano, or wherever you are, really do some research on your community college because I'm blown away just today how much is offered and what kind of great services you're you're giving with that limited budget that you're talking about, right? Your goal is to get everybody ahead. And that's what the 100% is. It's to give everybody that opportunity. So thank you both for all the work you're doing. We'll follow up with me on some stats and we'll throw it into the show notes. And I think my last thing here is when are we going to go to that like five star, $10 restaurant <laughs> on campus? Let's Rebecca, let's arrange that one. Yeah. <laughs> Get some city council members together. We'll talk about housing and we can show them our culinary program. That would be great. So, all right. <laughs> Thank you uh, both for being here. We really appreciate everything today. So. Thank you. Thank you. Wait. Don't leave yet. Hit subscribe. Make sure you get the weekly updates. We have a new episode every Wednesday for stuff happening in the East Bay. In the meantime, follow me on LinkedIn, Jared Ash, or check out our firm where we have a weekly newsletter and blog at Capstone Government Affairs on LinkedIn. Thanks for joining us today on the Capstone Conversation.